we, uh, we want to continue this morning in our sermon series on <clears throat> various spiritual disciplines. And I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1. And uh, we're not going to spend a great deal of time really discussing the particular text we're going to read as much as we're going to draw something out of a couple of verses, but I do want to set the context for us this morning by reading uh, uh, Mark chapter 1, beginning with verse 29 and reading through verse 39. So follow along with me if you uh, so desire. Mark 1, 29 says, As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with Jesus and John, excuse me, James and John, to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He drove out demons, but would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else to nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The disease is called Americanitis. Americanitis. Now, does anyone have any idea what a symptom of Americanitis might be? We've seen symptoms of COVID, but Americanitis, anybody have an idea what a symptom might be? Pride, that's a good one, yeah. Greed. Complacency. Complacency. Ignorance. Ignorance and tolerance. Yeah, ignorance and tolerance. And what did you have, Delvin? Me. Me, meism, all right. No, the number one symptom is running up an escalator. Americanitis. Fast-paced. Busy. Busy. I read a couple years ago where the word that people hate to hear more than any other word from anyone else. Delvin said this morning to me, busy. Because every time we hear that word in our mind, in the back of our mind, anywhere we think, you think you're busy. You think you got something going on. You don't know anything. Fast paced. Get, get in pace or get left behind. There are schedules to keep. There are deadlines to meet. There are projects to complete. We move from one frantic issue to another, and we say to ourselves, to the swift goes the prize. And this is exactly the opposite or the antithesis of Ecclesiastes 9.11, which says, The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Louis Grizzard was a columnist for the Atlanta Constitution back many years ago, and he wrote this line. I I love it. It He said, Life is like a dog sled team. If you're not the lead dog... The scenery never changes. To the swift, we think, goes the prize. Today's spiritual discipline is one that Jesus practiced in this text that we read this morning, and it is so far out of step with Americanitis that we just, we don't pay attention to it. That spiritual discipline is solitude. Solitude. It's just out of step with the times, and in the uh, light of the present COVID restrictions, you know, it's possible to become a hermit and never experience solitude. It's also possible to find solitude in the midst of chaos and turmoil. The text we have before us describes for us the busyness of Jesus. In those first uh, five or six verses there, the Bible says he'd been healing and and chasing out, uh, driving out demons and all these people. The busy guy been doing all this. And then when you look at verses 38 and 39, at the end of that text, you see that Jesus was destined for more preaching and teaching. He was going to get even busier as time went on. 
But verses 35 through 37 present an entirely different agenda of Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus needed to spend time with his Father. The God-man, if you will, needed solitude in his life. Someone has said, We have people who will embarrass themselves for the privilege of five minutes of fame on on reality TV. And we see it all the time, don't we? Politicians and television evangelists love publicity and will do extraordinary things to be in the spotlight, but not Jesus. At the moment when people wanted Jesus, wanted to force him to be the next king of Israel, you find that in John chapter 6, Jesus withdrew from the crowd. Instead of putting a microphone to the people that he healed, he told them not to tell anyone what he had done. Instead, he publicly, uh, instead, excuse me, instead of publicity, he sought solitude. He never allowed life's pace to deter him from spending time with his father. Busy schedules and important missions and needy crowds did not distract him from this particular discipline. He found a way to say, stop. The crowds are going to have to wait. I have to take care of my own soul. Psychologists say what they were doing an analysis of Jesus today would say that he had a, had a well-defined awareness of self. He knew who he was. He knew what, where his limitations were and where he needed to stop. Jesus connected with other people. He had compassion for them, felt compassion for them, but he did not allow them to dictate his agenda as we often do with other folks. Now, I want you to understand something about spiritual disciplines in general, and that is that spiritual disciplines are for the purpose of controlling our desires and feelings and turning them from our own personal appetites and setting them toward God. So this is about kind of minimizing ourselves, if you will. Solitude, the word itself, means getting alone for a while so that we can come to know God in a deeper way. It helps us align our priorities. It reduces our overstimulation. It helps us uh, hear and to think about what God has to say. Now we sometimes think that uh, it sounds weak or lazy or maybe even irresponsible to have to have the need to get away, to, to spend time alone. We often think that that all of life must be about contributing something. If I'm not contributing something to what's going on, then there must be a problem with me. Someone has said that our evaluation of the part we play in this world is based upon what we produce. In our success-oriented society or world, our lives have become more and more dominated by accomplishments. Spending time with God doesn't look much like an accomplishment, so we tend to avoid doing it. Or being still and being silent with God. Let me say that again. Spending time alone with God does not much look like an accomplishment, so we tend to avoid being still and being silent with God. Bob Borden, some years ago, writing in the Saturday Evening Post, said, If you can't stand solitude, maybe you bore other people too. (laughs) Now, look what Jesus did here in this text. The Bible says he got up early in the morning. It was a specific time. We don't know the time. Uh, it doesn't tell us 5.30 or a quarter or 6 or whatever it was. But it, it very early in the morning he gets up, before it got light outside, before anything else had the chance to alter his day or demand or require his attention. That's where he starts. The Bible says literally he went. Uh, he went out to a place to find a place uh, to pray. But more specifically, perhaps than in a figurative sense, this going out was more than just a physical thing he did. It was about his focus. He has had this focus early in the morning that he was going to go and spend time with his heavenly father and nothing was going to detract from that. And so moving into a, to a, the spiritual discipline of solitude, he sets aside some time that nothing is allowed to interfere with it. So he has this specific time, whatever it is. Now for us it could be any time that we set aside, but it nevertheless needs to be a specific time. Also, the Bible says he went out to this solitary place, to this place where no one else was around. He goes to a specific place. We're not told where it is, per se. But it's a solitary place. Someone wrote one time, at at some point, if you really want to experience God, you've got to get alone. You have to shut out everybody and everything else and be all alone if you want to experience God. 
Even if you come to worship among thousands of people, at some point to experience God, you're going to have to get away from all these people and things. And I, I, was, I was struck this morning as Richard was talking about all this during communion. I thought, you know, for us, for us on, you know, on any given Lord's Day, we come into a, a room like this or like our sanctuary with lots of other folk. And, and one of the times or some of the times when we're able to kind of isolate ourselves from people who are perhaps even sitting right next to us is when we go into a time of prayer and a time of communion. Because we're, we're thinking about things, these things ourselves. We're reflecting on who we are before God and not who everyone else is, or at least that's what we ought to be doing. I have a good friend back in North Carolina. Many of you have heard me make reference to him before. His name is John, and he was a high school principal uh, for a number of years. He's retired now, and he, he said, uh, he told me one time, he said, one of the things I always tell graduating seniors that I know are going off to college is this. When you get to school, I know that this year you won't be getting to school, kind of, but uh, when you get to school under normal circumstances, don't try to study in the dorm. He said, that's the worst thing you could possibly do is to try to study in the dorm. He said, you go to the library and you find a quiet place. And most of the time you're going to find it because there aren't too many of those people in the library. I can tell you from a lot of personal experience. He said, you go to the library and you find a quiet place to study. And you go there day after day after day after day. And you get familiar with everything there so that you can invest your time there. Because if you try to do it around people... There's always going to be somebody coming along saying, let's go get pizza. I would either be the person saying it or the pizza person volunteering for it, but uh, let's go get pizza. Or let's go over and check out the let's go over and check out the ball game tonight. Or let's run, go downtown to this movie or all these other things. There's always going to be something that uh, that takes it away. But familiarity, going to the same place, the same special place every time, helps our minds focus. And aids our concentration. If you try to do something, try to go through this ritual in, in lots of different places, you'll find that you'll be incredibly distracted. But if you do it in the same place every time, it helps. Remember what Jesus said? But when you pray, Matthew 6, 6, go in where? Go where? Closet or room. Go into your closet. Close the door and pray your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you openly. So you, you find this specific place. And so Jesus had a specific time that he got up in a specific place that he went to. He conducted there a specific action. A specific action where he's praying and, and having this intimate moment with his father. This time of solitude. Now when we think about this, I mean you can go back to the, to the, uh, the Gospels and read about the times that Jesus did this. And I kind of characterized or cataloged some general things that happened in Jesus' life as to why and when he did these things, you'll notice that that Jesus often did this before these, before or after these events. Before major life changes, Jesus did this. His, his life was about to change dramatically, was it not? Uh, when he, uh, right after his baptism, he was led into the wilderness to spend time alone with God, 40 days and 40 nights. Before a major life change, Jesus practiced solitude. Before important decisions, Jesus practiced solitude. To grieve over a loss. Jesus got alone with himself. Or with his father. After a great victory. I mean, when you look at this text we read, there were great victories there in verses 29 through 34. Preaching the gospel and healing folk and casting out demons. And Jesus says, oh, I've had enough of that for the time being. They're great victories. I've got to, I've got to go on. Or before a great spiritual events, Jesus did this. Or before the most difficult period of his life. Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane for solitude with his Father. And the options you have there are so many and varied. There's prayer, there's meditation, there's quietness. We've talked about those other two uh, uh, spiritual uh, uh, disciplines of prayer and meditation in weeks preceding. But someone has said the problem with most of us is that we want to experience God, but we're never quite enough to ex experience Him. The problem with us is that we're never quiet. We're always surrounded by people, and I might add, or other noises and things, and most of us are like that. We have our family that's around us at home, and then we go to work, and we're surrounded by people there. And even when we're alone, we're not alone. Now, you know, COVID restrictions have forced many of us to spend time alone, and some of us just can't handle it. 
I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're just going crazy, some of us, and all this. Jay read it this morning, though, didn't he? I didn't know he was going to read this verse this morning, by the way. It was in the sermon way before he, he chose to read it. But for, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And so, uh, if you're keeping score, if you want to write down kind of a summary po- a point of this a whole point here, that is this. These verses... Mark 1, 29 through 39. These verses show us a Savior seeking solitude. And I have to say, and I'll just comment on this right quick. If Jesus needed it, if Jesus needed it, how much more do we need? And so we go there, and there are three things that we want to do when we're in this, in this practicing this spiritual solitude, if you will. First thing we want to do is listen with our minds. Listen with our minds. For Jesus... It was to hear what God was saying to him. Um, now, we're gonna, you, you'll see after all the times that Jesus does these things, after all these uh, moments of solitude, that there's always some big thing that happens in his life and some other plan that he has to put into, into place and, and make work. And it, does, and it will not work if he hasn't practiced his solitude to hear what God was going to say to him. Jesus was constantly... Constantly and always in communication with his father in this, these moments of solitude as some of the most important times. For us, it should be the same thing. Someone said, a man prayed, and at first he thought prayer was talking to good, uh, talking to God, but he became quieter and quieter until he realized that prayer was listening, listening to God. Uh, back in 1979, January of 1979, I went to Joplin, Missouri to attend the uh, uh, National Youth Ministers and Youth Workers uh, uh, Leadership Conference. And the guest speaker that your primary speaker was, fellow that you've heard me reference before, a guy by the name of Les Christie. Now, Les Christie, for about 50 years, he's probably retired now, but, but for about 50 years, he was the quintessential youth ministry, ministry guru in Christian churches and churches of Christ. And I still remember this from 1979, something he said at that that conference. He said, if you do not allow God to speak to you, then you will not have anything, uh, will have nothing to say to others. If we don't spend some time in solitude having God say something to us, we will never have anything to say to anyone else. Jim Toon wrote in Christian Standard some years back, he addressing his uh, article entitled was entitled five, the five keys to effective preaching and teaching, and here's one of, here's one of the comments he made. He says, "Here's how you can tell for sure that a speaker hasn't prepared." So you can guess this morning if you decide that hey, Ron doesn't he can't even spend any time on that. Here's how you know for sure that a speaker hasn't prepared. His response was, "He doesn't say anything important. He doesn't say." People to stand up and ramble and talk about all kinds of things, but nothing important ever comes out. But we listen with our minds. It's Christian intellect, if you will, listening to God, perhaps through the study of the Word, versus how we feel or how we've been indoctrinated. Let's hear what God has to say about this. Listening to God is all about listening to God is all about determining uh, what He thinks and how He thinks and how He feels about things. So we listen with our minds in these moments of solitude. We also listen with our hearts. Now, none of us have ever heard God's voice audibly. It just doesn't happen that way. We might have nudges. We might have feelings or those kinds of things, but we don't hear him saying things. This fact, however, does not negate his attempt to speak to us. Someone has said the problem isn't that God isn't speaking to us. The problem is that we're not listening. We pray, but all we do is talk. How is it we can claim to love God and yet never listen to him? You remember Jesus said that to some of the folks of his day in Matthew 15, 7 and 8. He said, you hypocrites, he's speaking primarily to the Pharisees here. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. We, we sometimes hear and we sometimes will talk, but we don't listen with our hearts. Our hearts have been changed. So we listen with our mind, we listen with our hearts for change purposes. We also listen with our senses. How do we do this? Well, we set aside quiet moments. You get those impressions and quiet moments that God will say something. 
There's a proverb that I came across I thought fit very well here. It says this. All who open their mouths close their eyes. Now we would think close their ears would be what would follow. But all, I, I like that. All who open their mouths close their eyes. Because you can't, can't see what you need to see when you're busy talking, can you? You think about that. We say, well, you can't hear what you need to hear. That's true. But you can't see what you need to see if we're busy talking. We can't. So to see and hear God... We must shut out other voices, especially our own. I don't know if you're anything like me, but there are times that I'm trying to get along with God and, and I just won't let myself. <laughs> There's a voice inside my head that keeps talking to me and I, you know, I have difficulty shutting it off sometimes. Lord, I want to listen to you, but this nut that's on the inside here just can't shut up long enough for me to hear what the message is. Now, um, I read this, I heard this story many years ago of an Indian uh, who had uh, come to, to New York City, very first time in the big city, and, and uh, he was experiencing the, the, the big city with a friend. They were walking down the, down the street, and, uh, and all of a sudden the Indian said, I hear a cardinal. And, of course, the traffic's going by and people rushing and all the noise and everything. And, and he said, the, the Indian said, I hear a cardinal. And his friend said, how can you hear a cardinal? He said, uh, you, there's no way you could hear a cardinal amongst all this noise. So there, no individual single sound can be distinguished from all this cacophony, if you know what that means. That's a whole lot of noise going on at the same time. And so the Indian reached into his pocket and pulled out a handful of change and dropped it on the sidewalk, and everyone on the sidewalk turned and looked. We hear what we're listening for. We hear the thing for which we're listening for. And I suspect that most of us, if we were honest with ourselves, would say, you know, I, I, Lord, I, I had spent too much time listening for you or to you, and so that's why I'm not hearing you. Let's confess. Let's not try to cover it up with I'm too busy or something else. But listening for God will invoke his desire to communicate with us more. If God knows we're wanting to hear what he has to say, then he's going to be right there, Johnny, on the spot. Remember James 4, 8, the first part of that verse? Come near to God and he'll do what? I'm near to you. you got to start somewhere. You start moving toward him, he starts moving towards you. So the second thing, if you're keeping score, is these verses show us the need for seeking solitude. Jesus had to seek it himself, but it shows us the need for it. Now, as you work, as you read, have read through the text there when we came through, you, you know what happened. Jesus goes off and he start, gets in these moments of, in this moment of solitude. He's practicing this spiritual discipline and talking to his father and listening to his father and all these things are going on. And the Bible says that the apostles showed up looking for him. And there's always going to be somebody looking for you, I guarantee you. Always going to be someone looking for you. So the apostles went looking for Jesus and they remind him that everybody else is out looking for him too. Where were you? We were looking everywhere for you. You know, we tried over here. We looked down there. We went over here. Everybody's looking for you. We just, we just scoured the whole area. Everybody's looking for you. We thought you'd gotten lost, Jesus. We, you know, we know you made it from heaven to this world, but maybe we thought you got lost after you got here. We didn't know where you were. Jesus is off doing something very important. And, and, and what we have here. Is, is three things that takes place in Jesus' expression, if you will, this time he spent with his father. Here's what he gained in those moments. Here's what he gained in those moments. The first thing he gained was renewal. You know, I don't know if, you, if you've ever really paid much attention to this, but when you read through the Gospels, you'll discover that Jesus was kind of the life of the party in many cases. I mean, he was the central focal point. When he showed up, uh, I mean, everybody's thinking about him. He was a... You know, it shows up at the wedding feast and having a good time and goes and eats and drinks with sinners and all this other stuff. He's kind of the life of the party. But he still practices solitude and he needs this solitude for renewal. You can't continue to, to give it out if you don't have something putting it back in. And Jesus found this in this moment with his father. Verse 38, he says, let us go. I'm ready now. I've been renewed. Uh, we... Uh, and sometimes in our culture, in, in, in Christendom, we have labeled it for the past 150 years or 200 years or so. We've called it revival. Revival. Uh, renewal. Renewal. I've gotten straightened out. I'm, 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 you know, I'm built back up. Second thing, 
that he gained in these moments was transformation. Now you might think, well, why in the world did Jesus need to be transformed? Well, Jesus was human as much as he was divine in the sense that it was very easy for people to start to, or continue to pulling, continue pulling on him, wanting him and needing him and saying, let's go to this place or let's do this thing. Transformation takes place, does it not? Notice what, remember what uh, Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, transformation, we're transformed how? By the renewal of what? Our minds. We're, we're, our, this transformation takes place like that. Jesus said, now I'm so, tra- I'm so renewed, I've been transformed to the point that I'm ready to go somewhere else now. I'm not, we don't want to go back and, and, yes, there were victories in those other places, but let's no, go, not go back to those places and pat ourselves on the back because we had a certain amount of success. Let's move forward. I want to go somewhere else. I want to go to these other places. Let's go somewhere else, Jesus said in verse 38. He's not returning to a place of comfort, but he's plowing new ground. And uh, that's why you've heard me talk about it before, that one of the important things for us to remember is that when you're going down the road in in your automobile, you remember the windshield is a whole lot larger than your rearview mirror. Because where you're going is a whole lot more important than where you've been in the final analysis of things. And Jesus, was he he was ready to leave uh, those places behind that he had seen in terms of Doing great things. He's ready for a new challenge. Ready to resume. And notice how solitude produced this change. This is a, this is the key in, in spiritual disciplines. If spiritual disciplines, the ones we've talked about so far, if spiritual disciplines do not produce changes in us, then we really haven't practiced them as they were to be practiced. If we've not changed, then we've not been with God at all. Whether that's privately in, in solitude or whether it's publicly in worship. So Jesus gained renewal and transformation and one other thing that Jesus gained in, in, those, in that moment, those moments and I think we need to gain them too. And that is purpose. Have you ever gotten to a point where you, where you just kind of shake your head about your own life and say, you know, I, I, I saw this all the time with people in a nursing home. And it was a tragic thing to see because many of them realized as they got got as old as they got that they would ask, I, I, Lord, I just don't know why I'm here. I don't know why the Lord's keeping me here. I don't know why my life... And, and I don't know the answer to that either. Always in those people's lives. I do know this, that, that, that God will not take us before He's done with us. Whatever that means. Uh, however, He's going to use us even from the bed of a nursing home to change someone else's life, perhaps. I don't know. But the purpose is that uh, there's, there's a room, uh, when we go into a moment of solitude, it removes boredom from our lives if we're getting in contact with the living God. He offers us an opportunity for something new and it's exciting if we'll only listen to it. And so finally, the last thing I want to comment on there, is, the point I want to make is if you're keeping the score again, these verses show us the benefit of seeking solitude. Renewal and transformation and, and purpose that can be in our lives. Now, if you want to talk about what it means to, to really practice solitude and kind of come to grips and understanding with, with, with this idea, you'd have to look no further than one particular book of the Bible. And that book is the book of Psalms. David uh, spent many hours in solitude drawing near to the Lord. I want to offer you a challenge. Now, a lot of us think, well, the Bible is inspired, and, and I couldn't write anything that would that belong in the Bible, and that's true. We can't put anything else in, but we can write some stuff that's just about as in, inspired as what we find in the Scripture, especially in the book of Psalms. I want to offer you a challenge this week. If you get the opportunity, practice solitude at your earliest convenience or the first time, first time you get a chance, and write a psalm. Write your own psalm. It doesn't have to be three, four pages long. You know, David David had a psalm, Psalm 119. It had 178 verses in it. 176 verses, rather. 176 verses in it. Two, two psalms before that, 117, only has two verses in it. So I don't know. He just got long-winded one day, or long-pended, maybe, uh, and wrote a whole lot one day. But write, some, write something. Write your own psalm write, uh, that, that emanates out of the solitude you've experienced in the presence of God. I guarantee you, it'll help change your life. Thank you for being here this morning. Trust the Lord will bless you this week. Use you in a special way. Practice this spiritual discipline of solitude. See if God won't use it.
to renew and transform your life and give you purpose. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for the day, for every blessing you send our way, for the disciplines of Scripture, Father, that we find so that we can make them our own and draw near to you, knowing that if we do, you will draw near to us. Dismiss us now with your love, grace, and mercy and continue to bless us to your service. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.